I cannot help but notice in my household the way that people grow up. It happens so naturally. It happens every single day. They continue to grow up and get bigger every single day. I suppose if that feels this way now, where my oldest is only six, I can't imagine that it gets any better when my oldest is 16. We're all growing up in our own way, though. Or at least we ought to be. Some of us are just growing because we're kids and we need to keep growing. Some of us are adults. And we need to grow in ways that happen on the inside. I want to focus on that this morning. As we talk about growing up, maturing, moving on. From a state of infancy in our spiritual life to a state of maturity where we know and we grow as God expects us to. Let's begin with three passages, starting in Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Notice with me the way that growth is described here in Ephesians 4, and let's begin in verse 14 for context. As a result, Paul writes, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. Verse 16. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. I understand that he's talking about the growth of a congregation that we all work together like individual parts of a body work together so that the whole body can grow up. But I can't help but see that there is an application to us as individuals as well. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. When I see the phrase to grow up in all aspects, what that says to me is that we should never be satisfied with any deficiencies in our spiritual life. We're to grow up in all aspects into Him. So I'm supposed to grow up in the way that I raise my kids and grow up in the way that I manage my household and I grow up in the way that I love my spouse and the way that I love you. I'm to grow up in my charity and in my hospitality. I'm to grow up in my brotherly kindness and my love. I am to grow up in all aspects you're not allowed to just be a Christian who's satisfied with deficiency. You are not allowed to be a Christian who is satisfied just being infantile. And if you see in your life that there is some aspect of your faith and the practice of it in daily life that is deficient somehow, then I believe Hebrews 4 verse 15 is telling you, grow up in that aspect as much as in every other aspect of your spiritual walk with Christ. Grow up in all aspects. But let's also go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And notice 1 Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 with particular emphasis here on verse 2. He says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The thing about growth, especially for our little kids, is that growth is natural, it happens. I don't have to teach my kids how to grow. I don't have to sit my kids down and say, now this is how you make your, long, your, your, your legs longer, and this is how you make your skull bigger, and this is how you make your organs fit the rest of your body. I don't have to teach my kids how to grow up. What do I have to do for growth to happen? All I have to do is feed them. And if they have an appetite for the food that I am giving them, then growth will happen naturally. It's the way it's supposed to be. You feed the child's body, and the child's body will grow without any direction from the outside whatsoever. I think the same thing is true of our spirits. 
if we have an appetite for the right kinds of spiritual foods, then growth will be a natural result. Now, perhaps your appetite is not what it should be. That could be because of a condition that's been imposed upon you. A stress of some kind. A broken relationship. A health difficulty. That's not necessarily your fault. But I think there are still some things that you can control as far as how your appetite goes. You can control your attitude. You can control the kind of people that you have around you. Because their attitude will rub off on you as well. And you become, in a sense, a reflection of the kind of people that surround you. Surround yourself with downers, and you're probably going to be down. Surround yourself with strong, mature Christians, and you will, I believe, naturally follow along with them. Some of the conditions we place upon ourselves, though. But for whatever reason, if you do not have an appetite for the milk of the Word, if you do not have an appetite for the right kinds of spiritual foods, then I'll tell you, growth is not going to happen. At least in the right way. I suppose I could feed my kids nothing but sugar all day long. I could stuff them with cotton candy and funnel cakes and soda, and they will grow, but they won't grow in the right way. They won't grow in a healthy way. But also go to 2 Peter, and notice 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. And for context, let's begin in verse 17 here. You therefore, beloved, knowing this before, and be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall away from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. My takeaway from that passage is this. Grow in the hard things, not just the easy things. Like I said about kids, I could feed them cotton candy all day long. I could feed them junk food, and they would grow. <laughs> Believe me, they would grow. But they would grow in a lazy, easy way. They would not grow in the way that they're supposed to. They would not grow up in a healthy way. We need to grow in things like grace. We need to grow in our knowledge. Now, does it take work to grow in grace and knowledge? It sure does. It takes conscious effort on your part to understand harder, deeper concepts. I suppose after we get baptized, we have two roads that we can take. We can take the lazy road and never really grow and be satisfied not understanding the Holy Spirit and not really understanding grace and not really understanding judgment and not really understanding the finer points of faith. And we could be okay with that and say, well, I don't get it and I'm fine. Or we could do what 2 Peter 3, verse 18 is saying. Grow in those hard concepts. Strive to understand today what you didn't understand yesterday. That when you were a 15-year-old kid and you got baptized for the remission of your sins, you didn't understand everything about the Word of God. And that's okay. Because you don't have to understand everything about the Word of God to understand what you must do to be right with God. But as you grow, don't have the same faith that you did when you were 15. Don't be 35 or 45 or 50 and be basically at the same place that you were when you first became a Christian. You're not growing. You're not growing. The longer that you live in the light, the longer you strive for greater understanding of grace and knowledge, the more you will come to understand that. Now, the unfortunate thing, and this is the negative side to it, is that if you're not growing as a Christian, you are regressing. If you're not growing, in a lot of ways, you're going backwards. And I'll give you a few passages to consider on this point. Go to Hebrews chapter 5 and follow along with me, if you'd like, in Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 11. And I know it's a lengthy passage, but I would like to go into chapter 6 when we're done with chapter 5. So keep following along once we hit chapter 6, verse 1. Concerning him, whether Jesus or Melchizedek, depending on how you interpret that, concerning him we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. 
You became dull of hearing. I think that's an interesting way that he put it. You became that way. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. He says, by this time, by this time in your spiritual walk, you should have grown up enough that you could become the teacher and stop being the student of the elementary principles. You learned about shapes and colors in kindergarten. And you don't go to college so that you can review shapes and colors again. Grow up. Move on from the elementary principles. And instead of being the student in all things, grow up to become the teacher. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice, look at that, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Does it take effort on your part to grow up as a Christian? Practice? Training your senses to discern good and evil? That's on you. That's your responsibility. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary principles about Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we shall do if God permits. Now here's the really scary part. Look what the writer goes on to say about those who do not grow up, but instead start regressing in their faith. They're going backward in their faith. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they continually crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Now on a more positive note, I want to add verse 9. But, beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you. The writer of the book of Hebrews was convinced that because his readers had once nearly attained that spiritual maturity, that they could do it again. They could do it again. God believes that you're capable of growing up. I think that's a very encouraging way to look at it. He believes that you are capable of growing up and becoming the Christian that he knows that you can be. Now, does that mean that we all grow up to the same point? I don't know about that. We know from the parable of the talents that some people end up with ten talents and some people start with one and end with one because they don't do anything with it. Maybe in your lifetime you only grow from here to here, but if that's the best you can do, and you strive and you work hard and you study and you pray, maybe that's as much as you'll ever grow up. But that's what God knew you could do. Maybe some start here and they grow way up to the ceiling. If that's what you can do, then grow up. But the point is, don't try to stay the same. Don't sit in neutral because what happens to a car in neutral when it's on a slope? It doesn't stay put, does it? A car in neutral that's on a slope is always going to fall its way backwards. And that's what ends up happening to us. The Christians address in the book of Hebrews were not just sitting idle in their faith. They were, in fact, moving backwards in their faith. They were forgetting concepts. They were failing to apply them, failing to build anything. They were becoming dumber, not smarter, not growing, not more mature. And that's not the only passage that contains a warning about fruitlessness. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, Jesus warns us that your branches of a vine Your branches of a larger network, and you are expected to produce fruit. And any branch that does not produce fruit, it's going to be cut off and thrown in the furnace. Produce, grow, mature. Go to the book of Galatians now. Another case in point. And notice in Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. However, at this time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which were by nature not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things? 
to which you desire to be enslaved all over again. That's that regression that I'm talking about. You tasted of the good gift. You were on your way to salvation. You understood Christ and his grace, but then you turned around. You stop growing and stop learning and desire the weak and worthless elemental things again. He says in verse 10 that you observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. And this idea of laboring over you is not the only place that he talks about it in terms of laboring with a child. Move on to verse 19. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now to char change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I suppose we might say the exact same thing. If Sterling ever reached a point where, he was in where Rebecca was in labor again with him, we might all be very perplexed by that situation. You're only supposed to go through the womb once. Even Nicodemus understood that in John chapter 3 as he's scratching his head going, hold on a minute, you're telling me to be born again you're not telling me to go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time, right? We all understand that. And here's Paul the Apostle saying, I'm perplexed because you're basically going through labor pains again. You were born again. You were baptized. You're part of the body of Christ. Chapter 3 says you clothed yourselves with Christ in baptism. But what are you doing now? You're going back into the womb and here we are going through labor pains again. They had, in effect, retraced their steps and gone back to an almost fetal stage of development in their faith. Maybe it was their desire for the weak and worthless things of this world. He goes on to say in chapter 5 and verse 7, You were running so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I wonder the same thing about people. You've been witness to it. You've seen it. I fear it happens all too often. Somebody shows up at the building on a Sunday or a Wednesday. Never seen them before, never had a conversation with them in their life. And they come forward and say, I want to be baptized. Now, I'm not going to tell somebody no, all right? I'm never going to tell somebody no. But I always try to emphasize, really try to emphasize, what do you think that you're trying to do? What do you actually think is going to happen if I baptize you tonight or this morning? What is the result? And what is your commitment? Because baptism is not just a spiritual ibuprofen to make you feel better about your sins for a little while. Baptism is a commitment to Christ to become part of his body. And the person says, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, I totally understand it, I totally get that. And again, I'm not going to say no. So I baptize them, and we never see them again. We never see them again. Was the problem at birth? Is that when the problem started for you? Was it at birth? Because some people die to their sins, or so they think, Romans chapter 6, verse 11, but they never live for Christ. They want to feel better about sin. They want to feel better about their lifestyle and better about their choices, so they say, Preacher man, will you baptize me? Because I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm not living right and I want to feel better. I don't want to feel guilty anymore. And they think that baptism is some kind of a pain medication that will dull the guilt of sin for a while. And maybe it works. Maybe they feel better. They get all wet and they go home feeling like something is different about me. But they never change their life. They never repent. They never do anything different. So like an ibuprofen, it wears off. And they feel bad again. They're like Lazarus in John chapter 11. When Jesus raised him from the dead, Lazarus came out of that grave still covered in his burial cloths. Do we do the same thing where we are buried? We say we die to sin, but we come out of there and we still have our burial clothes on. We still have the old life wrapped around us when Jesus is beckoning us for saying, come out and live and take those clothes off. Take those burial cloths off of the face. Unwrap the new creature, the one who has been born again. 
There's a term that is sometimes used called arrested development. It's not used as often anymore, by the way. It used to be used more often in, in a medical sense or a psychological sense of somebody who grows to a certain point and then stops. The development is arrested and they don't grow anymore past that. Does the same thing happen to us spiritually? Where we grow to a certain point and become comfortable or satisfied or lazy or okay with ignorance and our development is then arrested where we never grow up past that. I want to show you arrested development in a parable that Jesus offered in Matthew chapter 13. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 13, beginning in verse 18. You're familiar with the passage. You know what the parable is, the parable of the sower. He explains it in verses 1 through 9 at the beginning of the chapter, and then gives the explanation in deeper terms here beginning in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower, he says. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Everybody starts with that seed. Everybody begins at that stage, don't they? It is the first step in the process. Some people never grow past a seed, though. Like Jesus says, when the word comes into their life, when the word is implanted, it never has an effect because it's taken away before it can make a change. The evil one comes and snatches it away like ravens come and snatch up seeds on the side of the road. It never impacts the life. Everybody has potential, though. Everybody can become a Christian. And everybody can grow up to become a very strong and faithful Christian. But we have to undergo a change. We can't stay a seed. Even Jesus himself in John chapter 12 verses 24 through 26 made it clear that you must go through a process. In fact, I want to read what he says there because I like the way Jesus puts it in this passage. <clears throat> He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, in the context, he's talking about his own burial that it was necessary for him to die and to be buried so that he could be transformed and resurrected so that the way of salvation could be brought to all of us. But then there's still an application there to the rest of us, that we're all like that grain of wheat. We're all like that seed. We all start at that beginning stage. And Jesus says, you have to die. You have to undergo a change. A process has to happen to your life or else you stay a seed forever. And not just that, but Jesus says that seed sits by itself and, and it dies. It rots away. If it doesn't grow up, it doesn't become anything. Anything but dust, at least. Growth is a choice, though, and many people refuse. Just as in chapter 12, later on in verses 42 and 43, we find out that many of the people in Jerusalem did believe in Jesus. They did believe his message. They received the word... They received the seed and they believed it. But they were unwilling to confess his belief because they loved the approval of other people rather than the approval of God. They were a seed and nothing more. And their development was arrested at that point. Now other people are baptized and they choose to become a Christian. They make that first step in the process. Baptism is, after all, it is the beginning of a new life. It is the end of an old life. And some people will grow to this point, but they end up having no desire. They have no resolve. They don't go any further. That's verses 20 and 21 of our parable. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. 
this might be the point where you just got what you came for. Remember a story in Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. Jesus encounters some individuals here in Luke chapter 17, most of whom get what they came for. Only one of them receives something true from Christ. It came about that while he was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face, at his feet, giving thanks to Jesus. Now he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten who were cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to turn back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. I fear that baptism is sometimes just a, a means to a very convenient end. That instead of doing something to change their lives, people come to baptism thinking that it is going to be some magical cure-all that's going to make me feel better even though I'm still going to live with my boyfriend. And it's going to make me feel better even though I'm still going to watch all the same TV shows that I did with all the profanity. And it's going to make me feel better even though I'm, I'm still going to be addicted to pornography and I, I have no reason to change that at this point. And, and baptism is going to make me feel better even though I'm a drug addict and I really don't want to go to rehab because of all the work involved. These nine individuals got what they came for. They glorified Jesus. They were healed of their leprosy. And then that was that. They never had interest in Jesus again. Some people grow to this point and never grow further. Others will continue to grow. They'll sprout. They'll be healthy. They will grow. But eventually they're swallowed up by the weeds. That's verse 22. The one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. <clears throat> I think this is where most of us see our arrested development. We want to be Christians. We want to go through the motions. We want to do what's right. So we come every Sunday, every now and then on Wednesdays. We put a tie on. We have a smiling face. We say what needs to be said, do what needs to be said, so that nobody suspects anything. That on the inside, though, there's no faith. There's no substance. And we're choked out by the worries of the world. We care more about our bank account. We care more about our job and our title. We care more about human accolades and achievements. We care more about our families. We care more about our houses and our cars and our stuff and our junk. So the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches arrest our development. They choke us out. And we never grow past that point. These are people who say, I'm okay not knowing everything. Eh. I don't really need to understand that subject any deeper. I don't really need to study anymore. I studied what I needed to know, and I got so far in my Christianity, and I'm okay with that. It's almost like they're casual, hobbyist Christians. That I'm going to approach my Christianity the way that I approach model train building. Where whenever I have a little free time and I can get around to it, I'll tinker with my model trains. Whenever I have some free time, I'll show up every now and then at church and participate as much as I feel like. But the growth was stopped. We never become more than that. We never become more mature. We never listen to what was said in Hebrews. We never press on to maturity to become the man or the woman in Christ that we're supposed to be. <clears throat> still others according to verse 23 want to grow the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil this is the man who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold some sixty and some thirty some grow more than others some produce more than others and that's okay 
You're not supposed to produce what the person next to you is producing. You're not expected to grow as much as everybody else around you. But you are expected to grow as much as you can. You are expected to mature as much as you can mature. So some people want to grow. They're not satisfied with lazy answers. They're not satisfied with half-hearted devotion to God. They press on to maturity. As you can see from this description, development is arrested because of three things. A lack of understanding because you never really received the word and never wanted to. A lack of preparedness where you weren't ready for the trials that came upon you. And a lack of focus where other things in your life choked out the word of God. I will put it more succinctly and say that growth fails because we don't want to grow. Because it's just easier being six years old and having life spoon-fed to you than becoming a man and taking responsibility. Christians who want to grow will grow. Christians who want to grow will grow. But that is on you. And that is on me. God has already provided everything that we need to grow. He has already provided for us the means. He has already provided for us the method. We must take advantage of it. And grow in the grace and knowledge. To grow up in all aspects unto Him. To grow as eagerly. To anticipate it. The way that a newborn anticipates milk from his or her mother. Are you growing? Or are you slowing? Or are you going backwards? Make a change today. Make today the day that you start moving forward. So whatever need you might have, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to come forward as we stand and sing.